Good evening, everyone, and very welcome to Trinity College, to the Trinity Long Room Hub. My name is Kieran Wallace. I work in the History Department here in Trinity, and I'm a member of the Dublin History Research Network. Uh, you'll meet some of my colleagues during the course of this evening's event, and we're delighted you could all join us here this evening from near and far. The Trinity Long Room Hub is the university's centre for research in the arts and humanities, and it does uh, tremendous work throughout the year on research between the different disciplines within the arts and humanities and so tonight's event fits perfectly on that so we're really pleased that it's a combination of those those efforts um, the dublin history research network is a group of academics working in the field of history uh, geography english literature um, and related to humanities sciences uh, working on dublin city in the post medieval period so basically from 1500 onwards and we have events, uh, we would have in-person events about every year or 18 months or so. This is our first event during lockdown, so we, we spared you one more Zoom meeting, but we felt this was such an exciting idea and topic. We're delighted that, to have this one out now in, in December. The, um, we'd like to thank the Trinity Long Room Hub and particularly uh, Francesca Rafferty and Cuiva Whelan for facilitating this evening's event. Uh, Francesca is in the background doing the technical support, so we're in good hands. If there is any uh, technical glitch as we go along, it's the fault of the web and satellites, not, not Francesca's fault. You probably won't see me again, but if there's a, if there's a breakdown in, in links to one of the chairs, I'll step in as a replacement chair. Uh, the chat and question and answer functions at the end of the screen, the chat has been disabled, so you'll just see the Q&A function and we'd invite you to put in any questions or comments in the Q&A as the conversation goes on and then uh, we'll have a, a question and answer session at the end of the conversation. So I'll put in a reminder to people to, to put in their questions as the, as the event goes on. Um, I'll hand over now to my colleague in the Dublin History Research Network, Lisa Marie Griffith, and Lisa will get the discussion going and introduce you to our speakers. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much, Kieran. Um, good evening, everyone. You are very welcome to Novel Approaches to Dublin History, Historic Fiction and the City. Um, I'm Lisa Marie Griffith, and I'm the moderator for this evening's discussion. Before I begin um, and I introduce our panelists, I just wanted to explain a little bit about how this evening's event will work. While seeking to explore the cross sections between history and historical fiction, the panelists and myself have read two historic novels that are set in Dublin so that we'd have a frame of reference. Now, I have to emphasize this isn't a book club. You did not have to read these novels. Um, it was just so that we had some common ground and that we'd all read the same novels. So the first novel is Emma Donoghue's The Pull of the Stars, which is set in Dublin in 1918. Um, published by Picador and explains what happens in a fever mater maternity ward um, during the outbreak of the Spanish flu through the eyes of one midwife. So a pandemic very near to all of our hearts at this point. The second novel is Andrea Hughes, The Coroner's Daughter, which is set in Dublin 100 years earlier in 1816, and it's published by Black Swan Ireland. And it's about an 18 year old woman, Abigail Lawless, who sets about investigating a murder in the city. Um, so our panel this evening are Dr. Juliana Adelman, who's a lecturer in history at Dublin City University. Her recent work, Civilized by Beasts, Animals and Urban Change in 19th Century Dublin, conjures up an unfamiliar city through an imaginative use of historical sources. Among her earlier publications, Second City of Science, Dublin as a Centre of Calculation in the British Imperial Context, 1886 to 1912, presents yet another view of Dublin. We're also joined by Dr. Gillian O'Brien, reader in modern Irish history at Liverpool John Moores University. Gillian has co-edited Georgian Dublin and Port Georgian Dublin and Portraits of the City, Dublin and the Wider World. Her research for darkness echoing, exploring Ireland's places of famine, death and rebellion, which came out this time last year, examines the powerful emotional resonances which key historical moments can create today. And then our final panellist this evening is Dr. Ava Walsh. Ava is Director of Creative Writing in the School of English at University College Cork. Dublin features significantly in his historical fiction writing, the mid 20th century city in The Last Day at Bowen's Court, the city which Handel encountered in The Trumpet Shall Sound and 19th century Dublin in The Diary of Mary Travers, 
all employ historical research to cre create imaginative fiction. So before we dig into the discussion, I'm very keen to define what we're considering this evening as historical fiction. So we're defining historical fiction as fiction that is set in the historical period before the author was born. And I will have to say, when we were putting this event together, there were a few uh, Google searches to make sure that when we're talking about these historic novels, we, we have novels that are set before the author was born. And we feel that's what makes them historic fiction opposed to contemporary fiction. So to begin with, I'm going to try and set the scene a little bit. And I'd like to ask all of the panelists, what are the elements that make a good history of the city? And what are the elements that make a good historical novel? And maybe you could talk about where they overlap. Who wants to jump in? I'll go ahead. I guess um, I guess one of the obvious things is is atmosphere. I mean, I really enjoy a kind of when I'm reading um history of a place um to get like some kind of um sense experience of that place insofar as that's possible. Um, and I also and I think what's appealing about cities maybe is the variety of experience, like of um so many different lives going on in the same place um, and the variety of kind of uh, even within one relatively small geography, the variety of experiences. So, and I think that's something that's kind of present in both of those novels and in good historical novels. Um, and I suppose historians tend to be quite focused on what they look at. So you kind of maybe get a bit more of that almost from a novel in some ways than you would from a standard history work because they might be you know focused on my book was focused on animals so it's not looking at and it's on a very specific time period which is probably longer than most novels would cover but you know it, it has a very it has a kind of a narrow gaze which um is true of a lot of historical works you know maybe it's all about politics of Dublin Corporation for example um so that's just <laughs> Just get the ball rolling. So you're likely to meet more characters, uh, I guess, is one of the things that you touched on there, Juliana, in historic fiction. I think that Juliana is right about sort of the, the creation of atmosphere is, is something that's key. And in some ways, historic fiction can sort of fill a lot of holes that a history book can't do. So, you know, we're very reliant on what remains of the source material. And a lot of that is of the elite and the wealthy. So historians have historically been focused on sort of both you know, the story of men because they've left behind a lot more and it's also the story of, of wealthy men. And I think <clears throat> novels are, offer the opportunity to look more broadly and those layers uh, can be told. I mean, I think historians are getting better at using you know, other sources like architecture and photographs and, things like that in a way that they didn't always do. But I think there's absolutely a role for uh, historic fiction because we're making, we're leaving huge gaps and making things up as historians, even though we try you know, to sound very authoritative as if we know everything, which we obviously don't. So you know, in many ways, a good historical novel is a really valuable uh, thing to have and, and enjoyable. Just to pick up on, on what Juliana and Julian said, I mean, I'm fascinated by this. I was a student of history as well as of English, and I suppose I, I took the track of uh, literary criticism, and then I've worked as a biographer before I started working in fiction and writing fiction. So I've, I've written the nearest thing you can get to kind of historical research in literary studies, which is a biography. I mean, historians and literary critics write biographies, so, you know, it's very common ground. I found the biographical form very frustrating in, in lots of ways because, particularly at my work on Kate O'Brien, because of the difficulties of sources. And I found that extremely frustrating. And a number of the reviews said that, and rightly. Uh, and the big attraction for me was that I think what history was when I was taught it a thousand years ago was that there were grand narratives and everything was clear. And of course, that's, I find that very consoling as a reader. I don't find novels consoling as a reader. I don't think they should console you. Uh, 
they should unsettle you and including the ones I want to write. But um, I think what we expect from history has hugely changed. And a number of the people here on the panel tonight would be people I know very well in, in terms of their work and what you, the work you've all been doing. And, and I'm watching it with great interest because it's very parallel to what I wanted to do. I mean, all my novels are to some degree lost stories, even with famous people. I mean, the most being Speranza, who apparently is very famous, but she's not. Her story is, a, is, is, is quite a distorted story. So, so much of what I think you've been doing as historians, it sounds, I'm, I'm, going, I'm setting myself up as like, it's, it's me and you, but I mean, I'm, I'm very admiring of what historical work has been doing because it's exactly what's happening for me in working in terms of literary history and literary studies. It's the idea of what constitutes our subject has changed. Uh, so much in the years that, that we've all been working and yeah huge amount of for me partly because of course I've been working on lost and and otherwise submerged uh, uh, LGBTQ lives and that was the other element that where history met literature as well for me so yeah just to, to add to that and come back to something that Gillian said about um you know about getting better at using a wider range of sources and looking at a wider range of people I mean I think one of the the obvious allures of kind of standard narratives and wealthy people in particular positions is just the availability of sources. And so it has been much easier. Um, you know, it's, it's often a lot of it in one place, you know, the official records and government papers, you know, published memoirs and things like that. Whereas when you try and reconstruct some of those other lives, you're, you're drawing together lots and lots of sources to, to come up with a, a pile of information that looks comparatively smaller. And I think that was something that I definitely noticed when I was um, researching my last book and which I think actually both the books uh, have done very effectively. Both of the novels have kind of gathered up. I mean, you know, a lot of it feels quite authentic to me, even the, the bits that are related to time periods I'm less familiar with. So it's, it's possible I have been, <laughs> I've been tricked, but like, you know, all of that information about ordinary kind of daily existence is actually a lot harder to sort of pull together and scrape together than kind of what's going on in high politics or, you know, elite lives. And, and I think both the, the writers have managed to get quite a lot of that, that feel Can I sound a kind of a, a, kind of a, a warning note or a, a, a moment just because I really want to hear everyone's opinion on this. And there's a question Q&A and which very good one about, you know, research and, and one of the things that I would say as a novelist is that, and I want to ask you actually the historians this, I want you, that the danger with writing fiction is that you overburden it with research. Is that the same for writing history? Short answer, I think, is yes. Mm. Um, I mean, I think one of the, the big flaws sometimes in historic novels is that the fiction writer has a, te has a tendency to put in everything they learned in the research that they did, and it becomes really clunky. So if they read a book or they went, and worse still, if they went to an archive, uh, and they really feel they have to signpost, this is work I've done, um, and I think uh, uh, where, where it's done well, you don't notice the accuracy and you don't notice that they've got the sense of the architecture because they haven't, they haven't been busy saying, you know, this was the architect and this was built. And they suddenly give people who wouldn't have known that at the time, all sorts of knowledge. Um, and I find that quite a lot of, and I think maybe it's more apparent in, in people who don't always write historical fiction. Uh, but who occasionally dip into it that they get overexcited about going to um, an, an archive and putting everything in. And as a historian, where that's sort of day to day work, you're like, oh, should we applaud this all the time? <laughs> uh, so where, where it's unseen, where you can't see the joins, that's when it's really good, I find. When I started writing biography, I asked a biographer what I should do. And, she, and what I should research and what I should look for. And she said everything. Uh, but what I then realized when I finished it was that I'd put everything in. 
and I got very, very uh, helpful advice from an, actually from a novelist, and he said, too many shades of the lecture hall. And, uh, you know, because a biography has to be a portrait of someone, it has to be an account of someone. You have to bring with you the, 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 yeah, the eye of a portrait, of a portrait maker. I was at a conference in the States where they were discussing historical fiction and somebody said that to research a historical novel, you need to be a detective, a historian and a novelist. But when you come to write it, the historian and the detective are sent outside the door and only the novelist can sit in the room writing. Now, again, that's that's something that it seems to me like I, 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 it, it, it's. I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a slightly perhaps unfair notion that historical methods are 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 antithetical to fictional methods. But I think in for both, I think for both historians and for writers of historical fiction, there must be the same principle. I mean, that's really what I was wondering about, which is like, essentially you have to shape a story. Now, the good thing as a novelist is you can make it up. Can you make it up as a historian? Answer me, historians. <laughs> Usually frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, it's absolutely true. Like you can't put everything. I mean, the same the same winnowing has to occur. I mean, I think I have another book's worth of material um, that'll never go in another book. Um, that just it just didn't fit. Not that it contradicted what I wanted to say. It's not like I've been selectively choosing things to suit my purposes. It's just you can't put every fact in or else, um, you know, I'd have a 750 page book that nobody would want to read. Um, and yeah, I mean, you, you, I think historians more, um, you know, more recently are, are maybe a bit more aware of the, um, you know, of maybe trying to write in a, it seems like writing in a sort of stylish way went out of fashion for a while and maybe is maybe slightly seeing something of a resurgence. And, um, and I think those kinds of books where it's mostly just all of the information I gathered presented is not, you know, is not the way that most historians would work now. Lisa can speak to this, I know as well as a published historian herself. Yeah, I think, um, Avery, you hit on a really interesting point because you're definitely still, as a historian, making decisions about how you need to tell that tale and how you need to come to your end point. So whether um, whether you're telling the history of a building, for instance, you're like making decisions about what information you think is most important to like the beginning of that project and the end of it and, and how it all came together. And you're definitely making decisions about I guess people's bias and their motivations as well, because you don't always have the historical sources to fill that in. So I don't want to say it's it's fiction, but but as a historian, you're controlling lots of facts and you're making decisions about what they mean as well, I think. Yeah, and I think with uh, historians, there's often a depending on the individual, it, they're very often thinking of a particular audience. So very often, you know, young historians who are out want, looking for a job will go with a very academic monograph published by an academic press because they need that for pro progression in their career. Um, and then you find a lot of other historians and which, you know, I certainly have moved into wanting to write not for historians, but wanting to write for a more general public and to, Kind of tell an accurate story but for it to be engaging and entertaining and trying to to work out that is in many ways a creative decision so with say something like the darkness echoing i had to put myself into the story because i could you know use that for the levity which i couldn't when talking about the famine and various things and it really kind of went against the grain um because you're you're taught for years in a university system that you, you remove yourself from that and so never use I <laughs> never use I and use the passive tense and uh, the passive voice and that ruins a good book the passive voice where nobody's responsible for anything so to unlearn all of that which I'm still teaching my students to do um was a really conscious decision of having to you know place myself in the story and that was slightly terrifying and I can see elements of that being similar for for historical fiction um where that is done without an individual button to two characters i i i think that's to do with the confidence of developing uh, 
a writer, whatever form you're writing in, what you're describing, I think is very true for us, say, certainly for me as a literary critic and then as a novelist. In your first novel, you know, you're like, as you say, you're kind of pleasing an audience, you're thinking you're timid, you're thinking, I think as you, what you're describing, Julian, is a kind of confidence in your own methods as a writer, a confidence in your own standing, your own, but I mean, it, it's also giving yourself permission to be the writer that you want to be. And I, I, I we work with a lot of new writers and younger writers, both. And really it's a question of saying to, 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 to writers of fiction that I would work with in, in, in uh, UCC, you know, that it's, forget about what you think you're supposed to be writing, what you want to write. And I think what you're describing in your work, Julian, is, is can only come from the confidence of what you've already built up, that you kind of built up the research you wanted to do, you built up. I wanted to read, if I may, something very short, which is I kind of made a decision. When I wrote Mary Travers, I sort of made, um, I was kind of thinking about a historical accuracy and the very thing where we're, so then I decided I want to write a historical note for my second, which was about Handel, who's very famous and rich and everybody knows him, except nobody knew anything about his private life. He didn't have one, it, it didn't exist. So for me, it was a hidden story in public view. So I, wrote, I said, historical fictions imagine past lives where biographical facts leave us in the dark. Little is known of Handel's private life. And so my attempt is an, is an attempt to imagine what he may have kept secret from the public. It is entirely possible that the personal life I imagined for Handel did really happen. But this is a novel, and therefore not true or real or honest. And I suppose I needed to write that for myself to say, it's a novel, I made it up. You know, don't email me and say he didn't live on that street on that Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, I'm writing a, a hidden story. So can a historian do that? Uh, well, I mean, I think you can make inferences as long as you're clear about the fact that you've made something of a leap. Um, because, I mean, you have, as, as you know, as Gillian and, and Lisa already pointed out, you have made choices. You know, you've picked this source and not that source. And that in and of itself is something of an imaginative leap. Um, so, I mean, I think, but, but there is, I mean, if you're writing for an academic audience, there's considerably less uh, wiggle room there, I would say. Gillian, I don't know which, what you think. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And I think uh, one of the things, I think I was absolutely right about it being something to do with confidence. I couldn't have written the most recent book, you know, 10 years ago, uh, partly because I wouldn't have had the level of knowledge, but I wouldn't either have had the confidence, I think, to, to do that. So I think that's really important. But I also think that there was an awareness that what we we assume is a historic source is everywhere around us and it's not just in um, the library so I think I, I began my book with an account of my grandmother laying herself out on a bed which to me is just as valid a source um, you know of her pretending to be a corpse to see what she'd look like uh, when she died um, as anything I could find in a library but if it was written down by somebody else I might give it much more credence or pay more attention to it um, whereas because it was you know my grandmother's story it was a st story I told in a pub to friends as you'll never guess what she did um, and it was just kind of accepting that that's actually just as valid a source as if I went into the National Archives and found that story there and I think that is a, a leap that you're almost trained out of um, and that you need to kind of come back and kind of embrace if you want to write in, in, in a way that is not dissimilar to how novelists, I think, approach um, their work. I'm just So coming back to a thread that Ava mentioned about um, where Handel lived on a particular street, um, I guess one of the um, elements that we wanted to tackle um, this evening was um, historic fiction and history writing in the city and of course particularly in Dublin and I'm wondering um, if you could speak a little bit to how you can kind of create an atmosphere or how you can rebuild a historic city um, both through history writing and the historic fiction or what elements do you think uh, you need to add into um, history and historic fiction to make it feel like uh, a really authentic, real um, historic city. 
Oh, that is a very difficult question. I mean, I think there's different. Um, I mean, I think there's one of them is just the scenery, you know, like I've I've got a picture from the National Library's collections behind me. Like one of them is is trying to give hints of the the visual, um, you know, as you perceive it, as the person moves around the, the city as your main character, or your um, different characters move around the city. Um, and both of the novels do that. I had marked various things, but we can we can come back to them. Uh, I don't know if if, um, if it's worth reading anything out loud, but you know they both have different um, approaches to the streetscape. I mean, I suppose you anticipate that there's going to be a streetscape somewhere in a in a novel set in a city. Um, and then I think the other thing is is the sort of um, giving some hints of the kind of social uh, historical context. You know, like what big events are going on that might be preoccupying people. Um, and what are the um, kind of, I, I guess what's much harder to do um, is to get inside the, like what would people of that time been have been preoccupied with thinking about, you know, what, and I mean, it would be interesting to hear Aver on this, who's actually attempted to do this in his, in his books, because that mental world is kind of affected by the city, but also affected by loads of other, um, other things as well. Every sort of novel I've written, and indeed biography as well, uh, place is central to it. And I walked every street I could. When I got to Rome, I tried, I almost, I think I got to every existing building that Handel would have been in, including uh, where he lived for two years, which is still a part of the Vatican City, although outside it, but I did manage to get in there. And the physicality is enormously important. And what Juliana says is really important. And the walking of a city, be it London, Rome, uh, Dublin, which would really have been the places that, and Venice, you know, because I just, I, I feel I'm, I must do my work for my fiction. I'm, 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 I'm selfless like that. I, I will go to these places and walk <laughs> around, you know, and um, although my current novel is set in my own lovely Waterford, so that's fine too. We can walk around Waterford. Waterford is worth work, a beautiful city worth working around too, isn't it, Lisa? But um, the physicality is hugely important, what Juliana says, and to think your way into a character and characters in a city, the physical space of where they lived. And I mean, the other thing I tried is all three are writers or have written, the subjects of my work have written letters, diaries, or fiction, the biographical accounts, and dialogue is so important. I was determined, mm -hmm. particularly, I mean, it's easier with Bowen because there's a lot of dialogue in her novels. And I debated, for example, if they were talking about a friend of theirs who was gay, what would they use? What word would they use? And I decided on pansy because it, they were profoundly unhomophobic. You know, many of their friends were, were, were bisexual, lesbian and gay. And that word had no uh, negative connotation for them. It was, it was, it was a, a, an acceptable word. And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, that's fine because that's the world they lived in. They, were, they, they lived in a bohemian world. Uh, I, I, I wanted in the, in the Mary Travers novel for people to speak to each other in the 19th century to say things like no, nothing else because the danger is you'll construct beautiful Jane Austen sentences or you know Dickensian sentences and if you look at Dickens and Trollope and people of that you know their dialogue is 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 sharp and and so the, you go to fiction actually somebody asked a question in the Q&A historical fiction or fiction of the period that you're trying to write about is really helpful because it gives what Juliana says that sense of what were people talking about what did what were in what were, you know, what way did young women express themselves on politics? The answer is, of course, very clearly and very engagingly. What way did men and women interact if they were of different ages or different um, social connections? All of those things. Novels, are, contemporary novels, not historical novels set in the period are really helpful. Yeah, funny. And actually, I see that there's a question in the Q&A um, from Jim Shanahan about exactly yeah. that, about using, you know, novels from the time as as historical evidence or as um, in Aver's case, as kind of uh, helpful to you for building your own novel. And um, I would say I really I, I'm not sure. Th I think I, I did reference in my in the, the last thing that I wrote, I did reference um, uh, a novel by George Moore, but I read quite a lot of historical fiction set, you know, that was written in the 90s, because it does give, it gives you something almost indescribable that gives you, uh, I don't know, um, 
even though you know you certainly wouldn't want to use it for um, naming a particular event that happened in a particular place exactly on a particular day, but it does it, it does offer something. I don't know. Is that does that resonate with you, Gillian? Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, and I think that sense of, of place, I mean, I, I do that as well with my writing, but it's really interesting that Ava, Ava does that as well. Um, I, when I was writing a book about a murder in Chicago, I walked every street to see the distances between where the man was taken to where he was. You know, so you got a real sense, even though you're in a 21st century city, what it was like. And I think that's really important uh, to to do um, as a historian, as well as, uh, as a novelist. And I think the thing that sometimes um, we lack in history books is the sort of sense of smell and hustle mm. and bustle. And I think a novel can really do that um, e exceptionally well. And that's that sort of, that layering again, is something that we can allude to in a history book, but you can't quite get that sort of, the sense of kind of the, the, the rustle of the skirts and the, and all of that, and I think you know that's really important to do. Um, and and I you know so that is where I think they overlap. And the other thing that is irritating about history books um, is that we set ourselves up to you know we talk about things um, like uh, the Georgian period. Well, nobody lived through the Georgian period. They lived through their lifetime. This is like a false thing where we talk about Georgian architecture it didn't just stop one day and become different. These are, you know, parameters and lines that we've all drawn because it makes it easier. So, you know, we talk about the famine, but not everybody, you know, nobody, had, there were so many different experiences. Mm. Um, so not everybody was desperately poor or starving, but we don't allow those stories be told as historians because, well, not to a very large extent. We're very much bracketed, or at least have been in the past, by these sort of false lines in the sand which I don't think uh, historic novels suffer the, the same way from. I think there's a greater fluidity. And I, I, you know, I think historians should abandon those you know, straight lines um, as much as possible too. I think the, the danger in historical, if you're writing historical fiction, is that the texture of what's different to us but should be familiar to the characters. So the dangerous thing is we should be able to have some experience of walking down, you know, and West Westmoreland Street is just behind you there, Juliana. So some experience of being there in the in the 1840s, where the characters don't remark upon it. Like one of us getting the Lewis there, which you can now. And you couldn't get it 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but the characters can't. And also the the author can't sort of draw the attention of the reader to it too conspicuously, you know. They, they, you know, they tucked into their capon or their their pheasant or whatever, or you know, they. So it's it's the and I think good historical fiction has to work away from it's exactly what Gillian is saying, a kind of image which is often drawn from popular culture and his and some historical writing. <clears throat> what does the famine mean? And if you if it drives, for example, a lot of the visual representation that we're familiar with, and if it replicates that, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's equally case, the case, I think, particularly for, I found in kind of representation, rep, trying to represent the 19th century, and particularly in Mary Travers, the case of a young woman, a single woman, who ends up having an affair with a married man. And the notion of her agency was something I wanted to be very clear on, you know, because it's clear in the fiction of the time that that's, that the what agency, despite con constrictions of, so, uh, of some constrictions around, around, you know, gendered behavior and things like that but within that there was there was an agency that we perhaps we can condescendingly uh, um, uh, um, assume isn't there you know what I mean sorry Lisa you're going to say something there oh yeah I was just going to come back and say well done to Audrey in the Q&A box actually who identified smell as well before yes. our panelists came um, or brought brought it up and I will have to say that actually one of the books that made me think about this a lot more that I've read recently was Juliana's book Civilized by Beasts um, where obviously you're talking about animals and so you're going to talk about smells and I thought Juliana did a really wonderful job of actually kind of recreating those smells on the street especially once you get into pigs and then like you tackled milk quite a bit as well. And I, like, I guess I just hadn't thought so much about how many dairies really would have been scattered very close to residential areas. And I do remember reading one area or one section of the book and getting quite a bit 
thinking about this now. Definitely, I definitely uh, considered very seriously becoming a vegan at various points in my research. And I did not pay Lisa for that uh, endorsement. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think the, the I mean, actually I thought that was um, interesting in the, the pull of the stars, as I think Lisa mentioned, the star is set in a, in a labor ward effectively mm. in a hospital. And that is one of the things that was very effective was it gives you, I thought it at other points, it actually was, was uh, lumbered a little bit by trying to express all of its historical information, but in the labor ward, it became quite, and there was a bit of that, but it sort of fit a little bit more with what might be going through a midwife's head. Um, but at various stages, I felt myself feeling a visceral reaction to the kind of the confined space, the smells, the, you know, so even though it wasn't an evocation of the city, I thought it was a quite convincing evocation of a, of a hospital environment in a, you know, at a particular time. So I don't know what either of you uh, had any particular examples that you thought like were, gave you a sense of smell or anything in any, either of the books. Yeah, I, and I think that um, the coroner's daughter is, it, um, I think, Andrew Hughes, and that wears his knowledge of the city very lightly, um, and that it's, you know, it's, you don't feel like I'm on page 27 of the book that he read and the research and that, and I thought that was very lightly worn. Um, with a Emma Donoghue book, I found it quite clunky, and I could almost see where she'd researched passages and and inserted them. Um, and do you, I know um, that you know she says that the book was written pre-pandemic, and I, I I suspect it was, but I also felt that it read like it had been rushed out, and if it had gone through several more drafts, <clears throat> that that those sort of really uh, joins that I kept seeing might not have been quite so obvious. And it may be that I was looking at it from the perspective that I had just also read, reread Iris Murdoch's book set in 1916, The Red and the Green, which I think is one of the best books around Dublin in that period because it's unexpected, it's an unexpected angle. And you know it's written with a very different perspective. And I, I just found, I think you're right about the labor ward being the most effective bit, but a lot of it felt quite, labored is the wrong word to use i think it was exactly what uh Aver was saying like you know the instead of thinking about what the person realistically would have not had anything to say about everything that was going to give a sense of place was put in you know so um there's a lot of remarking on things that you think if you did them every day they would just not come into your head. Um, I, I I wouldn't agree completely. I mean, I I and I I'm, I must think about the novel again. Um, I think because I, I suppose some of the remarking was the fact that they were living through mm -hmm. an unusual period. So that's a, a bit like ourselves. I mean, you know, we talk about like like it, it, like kids born in the last two years must think well, masks are just you know that's what everyone wears. Masks are masks and. You know, I, I know lots of people with babies who were born, you know, in the last year or two, and it's just, um, um, yeah. And so we, they don't remark upon it. We probably do a little more. But I, what I liked about the pull of the stars was that I expected Kathleen Lynn to be more central. Yeah. And I liked the fact that she wasn't. Yeah. Because the danger of writing historical fiction where you have one very well-known character, and of course everybody else is invented, is that the well-known character will, in a sense, topple it over. And as a novelist, every novel I've written, somebody always threatened to steal the limelight. It <laughs> always happens. And in, in um, Mary Travers, it was Speranza. So I'll go back to her. I want to write about her again, and I've continued to write about her. So I, I liked the fact that Emma Donoghue kept Kathleen Lynn a bit, not she wasn't set quite centre stage in a way that, she would be the best known and everybody else of course was invented so i thought that was that was something that i liked the coroner's daughter i had never you 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 very kindly invited me to come here and talk and asked me to read it and i did and i loved it i'd never read it before and uh i couldn't recommend it more highly uh, a good detective novel a good crime novel a good historical novel uh, i genuinely didn't know what the end would be it had a nice kind of little gothic feel to it there was elements of Bowen and, you know, and the city itself. I love the fact that it was North, you know, it was Rutland Street and, and 
a street, an area that we now experience in terms of sort of its, its kind of tenement history, but it was actually reaching to a point, you know, before that. And, uh, and Manor of Kilbride, which I know very well from hiking in, in Wicklow, just to see it back there in, in you know, I love the coroner's daughter. I was delighted that she forced me in a very busy term to read it. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for forcing me to read it. I, I'd recommend The Convictions of John Delahunt, actually, which is mm -hmm. um, the novel he wrote before that. And I read recently, it was very good. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I'll have to say is I'd actually read both of these novels before uh, we conceived of this event. And so I, I reread them for this event. And I was really surprised re reading The Pull of the Stars because I, in my head, it was set in the rotunda. And she was getting on a tram every day and going to the rotunda. But of course, that's not the case. And she's actually going to a fictional city centre hospital um, that might have some parallels with the rotunda, because I guess I, I put it on O'Connell Street as well, because she gets up in the in the tram and um, and certainly rereading The Coroner's Daughter as well. I, and I just say Andrew Hughes, who wrote um, The Coroner's Daughter, is a historian. Mm. Um, of course, Emma Donoghue is a fiction writer and it, it made me think about uh, where they're coming from in both um, their disciplinary backgrounds. Um, but it also made me wonder how much um, history and how much historical fiction actually depends on the reader and the reader building these um, cities themselves in their head and um, imagining what a historic figure looks like or what the accent sounds like. Um, and it, I guess I, it just made me think that actually the reader does an awful lot, but mm. just thought I'd throw that out there. Well, it certainly made me think because reading both uh, of these books sort of in a condensed period, which I wouldn't ordinarily do and also thinking kind of a bit more critically about them than I might have done had I just been reading them, you know, as my bedtime reading. Um, and, you know, I was doing quite a lot of, oh yeah, I wonder, could they have gone that far that time? You know, doing, because I, because, you know, I've spent years researching Dublin's history. And so it's a city I, I know really well. And so it made me wonder if I'm reading historic fiction about cities I don't know, how much of it is created in my head, maybe around a couple of landmarks that I do know. And what I'd loved if, you, if there were artists who could recreate my version of Budapest having read a historic novel about <clears> it versus <throat> what the reality is having, you know. So th I thought that was a really interesting sort of thing of like, I began to qu question myself um, and how much of my own reading. And in a way, that's exactly the point is it's a half, you know, created, and you know, the reader does some of the work, um, which, you know, I guess it shouldn't everyone, you should all have quite a different experience of reading it. Mm. I, I actually, distance is very interesting what you said, Julie. I was just thinking that, what I loved about the coroner's daughter was it really made you slow down and think about getting from Dublin to Manor Kilbride, which takes what half an hour in a car, mm. not you know, a little bit more. And then she was going on her own, and the, it was obviously a stormy night, but still the dangers for her as a woman, and but also the fact that she did it, and the kind of you know having to get from Blessington was the nearest place, and you have to send, you can't go overnight, and you have to send for. I thought it was really well done. You know the practicalities of six, of eighteenth century, nineteenth century transport. <laughs> you know. Yes, and it it was used, I think, really effectively yes. to ramp up tension. So it wasn't just like to show off that I know how long it would take and how complicated it is. Yeah. But it was it was well integrated as a kind of a way of you know getting you to the edge of your seat, wondering what's going to happen or is something going to interrupt this journey or thwart what she's doing or whatever. So. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good, that's a particularly good example of the way the research is used um, really effectively as a, yeah. as a way to, you know, enhance the story. Um, yeah. And made me as reader sort of slow down and think places you know well and you're experiencing mm -hmm. to live in these places at this period of time. Just to, like, I remember I sent uh, Mary Travers on a train from Westland Row to Monaghan and then I think it was Kieran very kindly checked it for me, Kieran Wallace, and said, well, <laughs> there was no railway bridge at that point. Just happened. It was coming in a year or two later. So you'd have to go to, you know, a North Dublin railway station to get a train north. And then everything went south from the south. It's a simple thing. But I was glad. But I thought, well, that's an interesting reality to the city you live in. 
you don't think about railways crossing cities and it was the time of the railway and it was equally helpful when my agent was working on it and I had somebody smelling lilac and it was June or July no it was July and, and he just said quite well lilac doesn't blossom in July and I thought, yeah that's great you need it's as much you need that's not a historical point but it's just a simple and the reader will go oh but the bigger question is and I want to again when you as a novelist decide to change something actually change it which a historian can't do and the reader says but you have her happened with me you have a character in your novel doing this thing but I have here the census form to show that she was this this and this and this and I kind of initially thought oh gosh now I don't think you can do that as a historian no but one of the things you can do as a historian is I think in a history where people are so contradictory and do ridiculous things and sometimes the history is more bonkers and more implausible than the reality and if you put it into a novel everyone will go well that's that you know that's totally implausible and they couldn't possibly have done that mm. whereas in history you sometimes get that complete implausibility is actually what happened um and so in some ways maybe his um, novelists are curtailed by the fact that what they want to write is possible but it wouldn't that the audience wouldn't find it plausible mm. um but yeah, I think you're right. We can't just make things up much as I'd like to half the time. And I think when a reader is reading a historical novel, they do have an expectation of historical ver veracity that they would have for a historical study. And you have, that's why I said, it's a novel. It's not yeah. true. And I do think those of us who read both genres, that there is a kind of crossover between the two. And there is a sense in which, sorry, there is an expectation on both sides. If I write a novel and I make everybody up and they're all living in an imaginary city and they're doing all these things, no one's going to say, but I don't think people lived at number 14 and they would normally get their milk on a Tuesday. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'd be curious actually what other people, like, are there things like that if they turn out to be untrue that, that bother you in a historical novel? I mean, I, I think most of the time I'm quite tolerant, although I suspect if it was about something that I knew an awful lot about, I might become less tolerant because um, I, I um, you know, I don't I don't mind sort of bending. But I guess if, if something seems if like the plot seems to hinge on something that is patently couldn't be true, that bothers me because uh, then I feel like, why did you set it then and there if that, you know, I'm just. Um, one of the, I, I read this uh, historical novel, I think it's called The Western Wind, and it's, it's a lovely book. It's very well written. But it, one of the things it hinges on is um, is a confession box, but it's set at a time when there were no confession boxes. And for some reason, that really drove me nuts, <laughs> even though I would tolerate like I think the the, the group, the Christian, uh, the brethren in the coroner's daughter are not actually they, they were sort of active in Dublin quite a bit earlier than the book. Um, there's some significant difference. They, they exist, but they're maybe not quite as presented. That's really, that didn't bother me somehow in the same way. I don't know why the confession box particularly irked me, but. <laughs> yes, and I wonder if, this, if the writer had known that, would they have changed it? Uh, she actually had an had, had a, an interview in which she said she found out later and but their plot basically hinged on this use of the end so she left it in and yeah but who, but who would know when there was no confessions except a historian yes except a person who teaches that in the reformation <laughs> exactly <laughs> I, I mean I, I would have a broad sense of that but I didn't realize yeah. that it was specific yeah. to them you know and I, I know it's very pedantic but for no. some reason that yeah it can be like a pebble tripping you up. You know, you're following, following, but it's great. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I have to Google this. I, I do find myself sometimes taking my phone. I go, that can't be right. And, and searching it. So like, I think that's, especially if you're hand, really doing something. Yeah. On the other hand, I think the, I mean, somebody raised in the, in the Q and A there about, you know, how historical fiction might help young readers or not um, mm. understand, make, I mean, I think anything that raises someone's curiosity about a time period um, or about any aspect of history is absolutely worthwhile. Um, even if, uh, even if you have to go look it up yourself to make sure <laughs> whether it's true or what's not. The, what's the first historical novel any of us read? Uh, 
it, I, are people reluctant to admit what the first thing that they <laughs> well, read? I can't, I can't I remember. I don't, I'll, I'll admit I'm at and proud. Yeah. Um, I read in. Yeah. Go on. You know, go for it, Lisa. And then I promise I'll confess too. Oh, I read, I, I can't remember the name, but it was an awful novel about um, Mary, Queen of Scots. And, and I've read, I, I think I read it two or three times. Was it Jean Plady? It could be, it could be. I read the very same novel. <laughs> not, probably not the same copy. Waterford, probably not the same copy, but the same novel. I know. I well, the, did you get it out of the Waterford Library? <laughs> she know my mum had it, so she very. But there were, as in the in the library in O'Connell Street, they would have been there. Jean Plady, I read everything by her, and you know, it was pure popular fiction. It, it, I mean, she was she used historical fiction, but they really were romantic plots. And you know, she knew what she was writing, and she she, but it was always centered on tragic uh, 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 you know noble women of, and queens and empresses and you know fleeing from country to country and all that sort of thing it was it was what's that Nancy Midford's character in in um, Pursuit of Lo the Pursuit of Love he, he gives historical lectures he said it's it's about the flight of the Empress Eugenie from the Tuileries it's never about the Tog Puddle, Puddle mur uh, Martyrs or something like that it's that kind of history it's always you know almost hello type history but I mean, historical fiction for young writers is very important. And, and you know, whatever it is, I, I agree with Juliana. Guys, you haven't said what your first historical novels were now. I, I can't remember. I can't remember. I, I mean, I, the, one of the ones I read early on, which is going to make me sound like I much, have much more literary taste than I actually do, is, um, is The Place of Greater Safety, Hilary oh. Mantel's um, French Revolution, uh, which is which I will admit fully, which relates to this question we were asked about. Um, I, I was, I taught 18th century Europe for a while. And like my version of the French revolution became what was in that. Not, I mean, I had to check myself, you know, because I was convinced that I knew everything about the internal life of Danton as a consequence of reading that novel. Um, should, should I confess that I also read and loved that um, at oh, probably yeah. a similar time. It's not my first historical novel, but for me, that, that was absolutely one of the reasons that I did take a French revolutionary course in college um, because I thought the novel was so great. It's a fantastic novel and it's enormous and I loved every mm -hmm. second of it and she talks about it being a kind of, a, I mean it was a labour of love, she spent a year researching it and talks about all the cards she put together for it but and she, she wrote it when she was living in, in, in I can't remember where she was living but um, it, she was li living outside England. Saudi Arabia. It was Arabia. and it, sat, like, and it a, languished in a drawer. And it obviously set the, the kind of the, the base for her work as, as, as uh, on Cromwell. And, yeah, and and I've actually heard her Dermot McCullough talk about uh, Cromwell, and and he very much agrees with I, I guess her take on him and her outlook. I am really aware that the question box is filling up, and I really right. have to tackle it. But before I do, I'm going to try and um, ask as well. Sorry, uh, if there's any particular um, histories of the city as well that you enjoyed or that you might have use as a kind of touchstone for your research when you're setting something in Dublin? My one is always Constantia Maxwell's yes. Dublin Under the Georges, which I absolutely love. It's beautifully written. In fact, a, a few years ago, I was going to redo and add a new edition of it, um, but we ran into issues over copyright. <coughs> Um, so it, it's sort of it isn't out in a new edition, but it's I it's what it's the book that made me want to write and research about Dublin, and uh, I think everybody who's interested in Dublin should read it because it's it flows beautifully. It's just great. I love it. There's a lovely it's review by Elizabeth movie. Bowen uh, who reviewed it when it came out, and you've probably seen it. And it's uh, it, it it they're a perfect matching of each other. I mean, Bowen Seven Winters. You take that and push it with Constanza Maxwell's work. I, I I use it all the time. I think I even have it. <laughs> Damn, it's my exhibit <laughs> off the shelf. Juliana. Um. Yeah. I mean, there's loads. Um. I. But if especially in terms of older books, like I do, like um the Dear Dirty Dublin um Joseph yeah. Bryan's um for for smells and for you know quite a lot of that sort of earthy gritty. Uh, element um although uh, I think he uses a lot of 
kind of uh, like you can find a lot of the similar material in his his earlier his chapter on the 19th century is a lot of stuff that you would see also in Constantia Maxwell's mm. um, book a lot of people return to the same kinds of sources to get that sense of atmosphere um, and I love the I mean they're not narratives but I do love the Kevin Kern's oral history um, of the tenements and of street life and lore I think is the other one um, because there's so much lovely recording of of language and um, you know and the way people talk about things that um, I think is just is great so they are brilliant recommendations. I'm going to throw in Morris Craig's Shaping of the City, even mm -hmm. though, but just, and but because I think it, uh, it's what I really enjoy, but has elements that I think um, are shared with Constantia Maxwell. And he has a nice uh, sense of, um, I don't want to say randomness, that's not the word, but he sprinkles um, his architectural history with lots of kind of colourful stories about people you might meet in the city around then. So I have to tackle this, really, these fantastic questions in the box or in the Q&A box. So I'm going to go to that now. Um, I know you uh, all mentioned um, Janet's question, actually, about... Um, historical fiction for young readers. So I'm going to read that out just to see if anyone wants to add anything. So Janet says, I'm interested to learn the panel's thoughts on the role and importance of historical fiction for young readers in terms of their understanding and connection to the past and how fiction can support fact. Yeah, I think it's that emotional connection that like, I mean, I would say that until I read that book on the French Revolution, I had no, all of those events for me were just, uh, you know, a sequence of, you know, very dramatic political events, but they had no personality. And it's not that that, that wasn't present in, um, potentially in historical writing, but especially in an area, in an era where you're just in a, sorry, in a field which is not your own research field, you know, you're reading kind of stuff for the purpose of, of teaching or just information, you know, it, it was that that drew me into the the people as characters and, and offered, even if it's a false emotional connection, it, it, it held out the potential that those were very human individuals that isn't really part of a lot of the literature about that period or the way that it's often taught, so. Does anyone remember The Ship That Flew? No. It's one I'd recommend for kids. Nora Lofts. Uh, kids in kind of, con well, contemporary, maybe 1930s uh, uh, Britain. And she was a writer of historical fiction for adults. But they find a, a small Viking ship and it, they, you rub it or say something to it and it grows and it brings you back to mainly Saxon uh, uh, and Viking and Norman England. It, I mean, it's a very English book and in a, in a good, very good way. Uh, but I would recommend that as a, I mean, it was, it was the notion of time traveling. I think I, yeah, under the Hawthorne tree has been, has been sort of the introduction to the famine for a lot of school kids. I know, I know a number of you know, schools use that book as an introduction <laughs> in primary level to introduce kids to, to that and that for the last number of years. Um, so I, you know, that's quite a good entry, I think, into if you, for children learning about the famine. Um, so I'm going to return to the Q&A box. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so Neela says, <coughs> descriptions of place, customs, food, etc., combined with spoken language to create atmosphere. <coughs> Excuse me. I like recreated language vocabulary in historic fiction. So it sounds like the characters are in another era. <coughs> Excuse me. How do you feel about using historic language versus using more contemporary language? You have to find the right historic language. And as I say, that was the, the, the point with Bowen. There's so much available for Bowen in terms of the language of the period. We read any of the letters of Nancy Midford, the novels of Evelyn Waugh, and Bowen's her own novels and work. The language of that class was very precise and very specific. And I had to be very careful to sort of reproduce that language, but also I had to be very careful not to be slavish about it and to find a way by which, you know, Bowen was Anglo-Irish, but 
in acts and she sounded literally like the late queen mother they had a very very i mean they were contemporaries and educated in a very similar way the accent was very precisely the same so yeah you, there's a lot of sources there if you go after fiction letters broadcasts it's harder the further you go back of course but i don't think you need to reproduce a sort of artificial language i mean i think you can you know i suppose if they don't i mean it, once they don't say totes or something you know what i mean um <laughs> kind of the <laughs> obs exactly <laughs> and you know they're in, in in a viking era but um you know i think you can simplify the language i i think anything over elaborate stops the reader i mean we're talking hillary mantel her dialogue is so careful i mean you know she's talking about very tough-minded women and men the center of power if they want to say something, they'll say it. They, you know, it's a, it's it's the court of Stalin. It's a tough place, so she 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 doesn't hold back in terms of the kind of and she's. I mean, the other interesting thing about Mantel is that, and English should be for all writers. She writes about all male cultures, all male worlds, all male conversations, and you know, she works between every. You have to have that ability. Pat Barker is another very good example, who writes First World War novels where much of it's at the trenches. So she has to create these entire worlds where, you know, there are some women, but not as many as, you know, at home. And uh, it's not to make the language over elaborate. It's a very hard skill to get right. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a place where looking not just, say, at historic fiction, which I know is what we're doing, but it's when you, you know, it's plays set in a historic period as well. Um, I think the language, it's... I really like that you get that sort of in your ear, which you don't get when you're working in a library and try reading things. And I think there's something about hearing sentences, which are you know, created, but that it's, it's when there's an anachronistic word that throws you and then you're out. Somehow you're out of the 18th century because they've used something that just doesn't fit. And you suddenly find yourself back in the now um, and it can be very jolting. Um, but I do like when there's good dialogue that makes you feel like this might have happened and you can place yourself back in that time and you don't get that so much with the history book except when you're using letters which is quite different though from a you know conversation because it's very hard unless you're doing you know, it's very hard to replicate conversations because we don't have them and, and unless you get up as far as doing oral history and things and even then it's a different style and people uh, I would know when I've done oral uh, recordings and you're sitting having a chat and everything's like this and where you know it's a chat and then you turn the recorder on and everybody goes terribly posh mm. and it's not it's it's still different even though it's kind of a different it is in a different setting um so I've, I've always found that quite interesting that even when you're recording someone it's not them quite as as they are and the further back you go the more that somebody's voice has been recorded by somebody who is of a different class and has therefore taken their own expectations. Uh, there's a really great um, segment of a book um, that I use with undergraduates by John Arnold. Of, I think it's just called uh, History, a very short introduction. And he uses um, the way that Harriet Tubman um, was re reported um, speaking in different newspapers, you know? And so it, like the voice is, is you know that that um is just changed based on the same speech is heard by multiple reporters and they all um give uh give the speech differently like give play up the accent or the you know the figures of speech or else make her sound very uh ordinary like she was a middle class white woman so it's very um so i think I don't know what it is when it sounds right. Um, and it's probably, um, we could never know if it's right, but it, there is something, um, uh, you know, there is something nice to, to catching that in a novel, which you know, you don't really uh, have access to in, in times past really. Thank you. Going back to the Q and A box. Um, Michael Casey says, sometimes historians will write about what characters is thinking. Is that a problem for accuracy? How does a historian know what someone is thinking? Certainly not a problem for a novelist. It's a good question. Yeah, well, you don't. I mean, you're again in the same, you're just, you're just adding up pieces of evidence. And I think usually when people do that in a historical work, they're pretty clear about the fact that they're making a, an educated guess, um, I suppose. Um, and 
Yeah, and there's, I mean, that's why, that's why history keeps getting revised is because somebody comes along and says, well, I don't like that educated guess. I think you've, you know, I'm going to look at these other sources and say that actually they weren't thinking that they were thinking this or, um, you know, this wasn't the reason that that happened. It was really much more about this other cause. I don't know. Do yeah, historians, I think sorry, Julian, do historians, no, no, go ahead. do historians speculate on what people were thinking? Oh, definitely. Mm, okay. <laughs> they should. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, so back to our Q and A box. Um, Audrey says <clears throat> an unpublished novel set in Dublin, seventeen ninety eight. It's best on, based on the life of my three by great grandmother Mary Moore, who was a member of the United Irishmen. I agree about dumping lots of historical facts and having fun with the fiction. I gave Mary a love story. That sounds like loads of fun. It does. <laughs> yeah. And Paul says, could you comment on the role of historical research being primarily to stop you putting unhistorical stuff in the novel and secondarily putting uh, in some background? So I guess it's that balance really of making something believable and that's why we do the research and making sure that it's an immersive I mean I guess it's just like it's just like if you were setting a contemporary novel it needs to have that sense of a specific time and place um even if that time and place is now and you know some and um yeah so I I think I think it's just the or like in a fantasy or a science fiction where you know the whole the whole place the whole world is created it's it's about the historical research i guess is about making that world convincing for the purposes of your story um and maybe in the case of historical fiction it's to not leave something in that seems so glaringly wrong that it it ruins that sense of of atmosphere I guess it's in many ways there, there are similarities with any type of writing in that you have to make it plausible and believable so if you're creating a whole new world you still have to make it add up so that these things can happen or if you're writing it about contemporary Ireland it still has to or anywhere it still has to work or flow and, and be you know there has to be a plausible plot well, I guess it doesn't have to be but if you want it to be good so it does um, and with the historical research I think one of the great advantages that a novelist has is that they can make that leap so you've done all your research and then you want something to happen you can generally make that happen um which I often wish uh, was the same you know, when you're writing a history book is you, you this is how you want it to be but you can't quite make that that leap across and um, so historical geographer of this city Ruth McManus popped the Q&A box um, about a point Ava made earlier, very good point, an otherwise enjoyable novel set during the emergency in Dublin had everyone lighting cigarettes every five minutes and it was terribly distracting. <laughs> I definitely agree with Ruth, but things like that can really distract and I guess sometimes you think, mm, I wonder what else they might have got wrong and you kind of, well, certainly I do. Um, and Michael Casey added, uh, what about Strumpet City? And Bridget's added oh. favourite is Strumpet City. And I think that's, oh, you know, that's all you need to say. What about Strumpet City? Why haven't we mentioned it yet? Yeah. Uh, Juliana and I were speaking earlier in the week about what our favourite historic novel is. And I think Strumpet City gets it for me. Uh, or it's set in Dublin, certainly. Yeah. I, love, like to... I love Strumpet City. And I, I think the... Um, I actually I, I got it out of the library again to remind myself of, of um, some bits of it and like I think um, one of the things that strikes me is it was how amazing it does of a job of having so many different social layers in the same book which I think is something that's so Dublin that it, it just which I think I actually felt was quite lacking from the both the books that we read which had bits of you know different characters from um, different uh, social strata, but you know. But anyway, I love I love Trump City, and it's it's it seems to me to be the book is a is as much about Dublin as it is about the people. I don't know if that just sounds very obvious, but um, it couldn't have been set anywhere else, you know. Whereas I feel like the other two books, even though they were beautifully 
kind of related to, they actually could have been set somewhere else. Does that make any sense? I don't know. Mm. That... <laughs> I think so. Does anyone else want to add anything about that? No, apart from Strumpet City is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is. I think that makes perfect sense. I, you know, and, and this idea that you can rebuild Dublin um, based on, on Ulysses, Strumpet City really is, is very effective at rebuilding that kind of early 20th century uh, Dublin um, and um, I think it was done very well. Um, Nuala's question. Well, Strumpet City, sorry, fit, fit your, your, your definition of the author being dead. Yes, I actually <laughs> checked this <laughs> after I spoke. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's born in 1920, I think. I looked it up. Uh, so just, yeah. Um, on the cusp, but isn't that interesting that he's so close as well to yeah. um, the uh, events that he's the talking Wal about. The Walter Scott Historical uh, Novel Prize is £25,000 sterling and sponsored by the Duke and Duchess of Buccleu, uh, who, who and uh, that's awarded you to, to, be, to enter. You have to have written a novel based at least 60 years before like today or whenever you submit it but that's how they define it oh so you don't have to be you you ha you could have been born um at the time that the novel is set absolutely okay. or you could have been born yes when which well, would be my case for bowen at least um yeah you you could be alive uh, at the time that the, some of the novel but the bulk of the novel has to be i think 60 years previously to the uh, to, to like today or to whenever you send your novel in so they, they give about a 60 year gap it's interesting i i hadn't heard that definition before which lisa mm. started with because um because of course historians who do contemporary history work on things that may have only happened a decade or two ago um and nobody has any trouble calling that well maybe some people do but you know that's we still call that history so um i didn't realize that the that there was a definition of historical novel that it had to be uh before your uh birth we have another historical novelist in the uh, q a laura mckenna um who i think makes a really good point about um uh unless there's a another uh, an, another person who's not a historical novelist with the same name I think um, it's about, laura. <laughs> about uh getting you know, using tiny details mm -hmm. that are specific. It's that world building again, the kind of specific details of the time period that just help you get a sense of a character, um, which she does very beautifully in her historical novel. Um, well, I think um, Nuala O'Connor is in the Q&A box as well. Um, and Nora, which I read earlier this year and is one of my favorite books this year actually, is the 2022 One, du uh, one Dublin, One Book. Um, and Juliana actually asked why we didn't choose it for this. And I, I think the other two books that we, we chose were more primarily set in the city. Um, not that that's... Both Laura's book and Nuala's book have a little bit in Dublin. Yes. Um, okay. So, yeah. So those I'm are gonna... definitely to be recommended. I don't know if Kieran Wallace is listening, maybe he can <coughs> pick them up in the, in the, um, in the chat wherever he put the links to the other books as well yeah, so it's it's nora by Neil O'Connor and uh words words to shape my name the name by laura mckenna well, i'm gonna i'm gonna go back to jim shanahan's comment here that says while i agree that a good rule of thumb definition of a historic novel is a novel set book for the old <laughs> born because i was starting to wonder where we got that from in other words a product of research rather than experience there is another way that novels can be historical as time passes Contemporary novels become part of the past and as such historical artifacts and cultural snapshots of a moment in time, I'd be interested to know what the panel feel about using novels as historical evidence about the time in which they were written. Uh, well, I use them a lot in that capacity um, as because they were read by people, they were bought by people, they had an Im impact on the world in the way that you know novels written now um, have influence. So, um, and also for what they tell you about place and a space. So um, when I'm writing about a particular period, I also read a lot of books that you know were popular at that time in those places. Um, and I think it's just a good way of getting into yourself into this headspace of, of a period. I mean, it's not quite um, method 
uh, writing or reading, but you know, there is a sort of slight element of that to it. We have yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Well, while Lisa is, is scrolling for another question, I totally agree. I mean, I, I think it, it gives you something that you don't get out of other sources, even just a sense of what people thought was entertaining. I mean, one of the things that's hardest to get uh, from standard sources is, to, I mean, getting a historical joke is like getting a joke in your second language. It sort of makes you feel like you've achieved some cultural understanding and you can get that from from fiction, I think. Um, so Derville Murphy says, have the panelists used creative writing as a research methodology? In particular, did Aver discover new facts through his writing that would not have been possible using traditional research methods? I suppose you, uh, in writing historical fiction, you do invent. So, you know, the process of imagining you don't discover facts, but perhaps you imagine new elements to the hidden part of the story that you're trying to write. So, um, I mean, I do historical research for all my novels and, you know, I kind of discover as much as I can and live the lives and walk the walk of the people and all that. But <clears throat> often you have to give yourself permission to see the lives that you're imagining and invent elements for them and, and things that happen to them in a way that may or may not be true. For example, I tried to discuss the notion of the secret or the, the, the private nature of Elizabeth Bowen's long and successful marriage <clears throat> and how that worked in terms of her relationship with Charles Ritchie, who's the center of the novel. So I came up with kind of a sense, an idea of a number of questions people have had about her marriage. And I came up with a few ideas and it's just a theory, it's a possibility, it's an explanation, it's connected to Bowen and uh, her family hereditary and particularly the, the, the history of her, the medical history of her, of her father's family. And so I used that to try and see that as a way of thinking about why her marriage took the course that it did and, and why it worked and what, but it worked in what we would consider perhaps an unconventional way. So I suppose, yes, I, I made up things to try and solve what we just don't know, but I did draw upon what, you know, what we know of perhaps the circumstances. So again and again in my fiction, what I try and do is have a plausible sense of what might have been the private reasons for what happened in the people's lives based on what we know around them. It could be completely wrong and I don't care. <laughs> it's, a, it's a novel. Um I mean, I think writing is is a way of thinking. So, I mean, I, I often find that I don't know what I think I make of the material that I have gathered until I try to express it in words. So it's not exactly the same as what Ava is describing there, but writing history is also a creative process. And I think, um, you know, you are looking for those connections between things for being able to convey something more than the sum of the parts. And you never know that until you until you try to write something about it. I mean, it's, it's very different than my, obviously, than my notes that I've collected, which probably wouldn't make sense to anyone and certainly are just individual pieces of data. And it's, it's only with the writing that you, that you can turn them into something else. Yeah, I, I found um, that uh, in the last book where I was on the road for most of two years in and out of museums and B&Bs and having conversations that actually, and it wasn't really so much part of the research process, or at least I didn't think it was, but it was having conversations with people about what their perception of different elements of Irish history and uh, writing. And because I, I wanted to look kind of, I used a lot of old um, travel books to get myself around Ireland and try to recreate some of the old John Hind postcards as just something to entertain myself on the way. But the conversations that kind of came out of all those other conversations had certainly an impact on how the book ultimately was framed in a, in a slightly unconscious way. I think a bit like you said, Julianne, it wasn't until I came back and sat down and uh, which was in lockdown and I was sort of forced into six months of going absolutely nowhere uh, like everyone else that th that all began to sort of coalesce in a, in, a, in a way I hadn't necessarily anticipated. And I think one of the things I guess for both history writing and 
maybe fiction as well, is that you you are sort of led in a, in a way or that you you aren't restricted by a plan that you've necessarily had to set out um, because certainly any of the books I've written have not been the books I thought I was setting out to write. Maybe that's maybe that's a flaw. I'm not sure. No, I would agree with that. I don't know, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's interesting, actually, because you're you're capturing and one of the things, Gillian, that your book draws out really well is um, this sense that um, history is uh, Irish history is a feeling to lots of Irish people and they have this feeling of how things went and uh, you know a feeling of injustice um, about a particular neighbor of ours you know and I think sometimes actually they can be challenged then um, when they come into the classroom uh, particularly in university uh, you know, to say you have to put that aside and actually let it down and, and sift through the facts and and that that can be difficult. And I guess sometimes that might be why history is. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I refer to it as history by osmosis, uh, where people think that they're because they're from somewhere that somehow by standing on the soil they have him you know sort of sucked up all the knowledge about the 1798 rebellion and somebody from outside can't possibly, despite the fact that they've done a PhD and many years of research, couldn't possibly know more than they did. And that, that used to be my grandfather, who was from Wexford, and his understanding of the 1798 Rebellion is the lyrics of Boule of Vogue. And there was the fact that I had a whole PhD written about it didn't matter a jot because he was from Wexford and sure that was all he needed. But he was just one example of loads. Of, I mean, we absolutely have history by osmosis um, of, you know, if you're from there, you know it all, even if you've never picked up uh, a book in your life. Um, and it's, you know, it was entertaining and frustrating <laughs> at times. I, I ran a, a two term history course on Dublin history in, in Trinity one year. And I remember mentioning towards the end of the first term that I was not from Dublin and it was a course on Dublin. And I was looked at with great distrust <laughs> after, that. you know, that I couldn't really understand it because um, I hadn't been born in the Rotunda. And as I said to someone recently, just because I've given birth to someone in the Rotunda, that doesn't make me any more of a Dublin. <laughs> there is, is definitely a sense of um, propriety and, and um, emotion, I guess, as well, and, and feeling. Um, just to go back to the Q&A box, um, Eber Lawler says, to get a sense of time, I use newspapers, um, headlines, the protagonist may see also music on the radio. I think they're really nice atmospheric ways of like, you know, marking out time passing and really <coughs> effective. Just wonder if anyone else has any um, kind of notes like that that they've seen in historic novels um, that they like. Well, we would use that very much in kind of teaching fiction in every genre. So it isn't just historical fiction and poetry, you know, uh, people in creative writing workshops we use all those prompts so it's it's across the board it's about stimulating and imagining you know kind of remembering sensation trying to recall so we can use that for historical fiction we can use it for all kinds of fiction you know all kinds of prompts so you know food taste you know newspapers you know I mean I find newspapers are just and um, journals I remember doing research on something and reading the Irish well, what was the university review and they had ads for the businessman's flight by Aer Lingus to London, which printed the entire menu. And I think it was called the businessman's flight to London. And I just sat there for hours thinking about the menu because you had an entire meal served from Jamais on your morning flight. And I think it cost 12 pounds, 16, whatever, shillings and fourpence. But I was thinking, how do they serve an entire you know, steak and lobster bisque and this and that and this and that, you know, so you kind of get, you're supposed to be looking up, you know, pieces from the Irish University of 1964. And all I was fascinated on was, imagine being the person serving that, well, the air, the air steward serving that food, steward is serving that food and the whole dynamic of having to, you know, sort of present this entire sort of gourmet menu you know, for businessmen. It was just so much was packed into that. And you got every bit of the menu on the ad, you know. Of course, it also sounded delicious. Maybe not the steak, but everything else sounded good. I'm conscious that we are running out of time. So to wrap right. this up, I would like to ask the panel, um, what challenges do you think a historian...
has writing about the city that um, a historical fiction writer does not have? Or maybe to flip the question, what challenges does a historic fiction writer have that a historian doesn't face? as a historian you you can fall into big holes and huge gaps and you can start off sort of enthusiastically um, and be sure that you're going to you know, be able to write an article or a piece about this and then suddenly find an absence of information uh, that you can you can get from this you're here and you need to go here and you have information on both of these but you can't make that leap um, and that can occasionally happen I mean let, I think the broader we are with the sources we use the less frequently that happens. Um, but there is often a danger that at the start of a project, you'll run into a wall that you kind of can't get past. And, and that does happen. Um, and you've got to go, you know, it's like snakes and ladders, you go back to the start. Um, so I think that's one of the one of the issues I think that historians will have. Oh, I don't know, Ava, I think you should comment on historical fiction. You've written sort of both, so you can. Yeah, I, I think the historical novelist needs the historian very badly. And I think there's a great deal uh, of kind of inter, you know, there's a great deal of interconnections. And that's why, you know, um, I think all historians read historical fiction. Is that true to say? I bet they do. You know, they, they just, no. you know, it, 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 is we that don't no? know that that's true. Oh, they don't no, read they're... crime fiction. Oh. I think, I think well, a lot good. of historians don't read fiction at all. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not entirely convinced. That, <gasps> yeah, I'm learning things that I don't. My naivety, <laughs> my naivety is, is 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 crumbling. I would have assumed that if you love history, you want to read historical fiction or crime fiction or you know any all the genres, but maybe not because I suppose all the historians I know use fiction. They use literature and vice versa. Most of the literary people I know use history and cultural history. I mean, Irish studies, Irish writing. You can't. You can't write about you know. Colm Tobin without writing about his work as a journalist, his work as a historian, his work as a commentator on, you know, a travel writer, everything, you know, he's just, you cannot seal him off historically and say, or Peter Ryan, you cannot seal them off historically and say, you know, oh, they wrote wonderful novels in their room and let's talk about the images and, you know, we can do that too. So I would assume that most historical novelists are very dependent on history and historians. I think that's the case. A historical fiction writer has to be reading history, of course. And then we are very dependent, but I think a sense of which the way that historical research has changed in the last 20 years is, is very helpful for the writer of historical fiction, because I think it has changed and the kind of stories that are being told have altered. And, I, and that would be my sense. But there, it seemed to me that they both sides, they would be you know, very necessary to each other. Absolutely, Ava. I, I think that's a really good note to end on, actually, is the dramatic changes in the in the stories that we are telling, both through historical fiction and oh. history um, in the last kind of 10 to 20 years um, and shorter. Um, so I am going to try and wrap up on time. And I would just like to say thank you so much to the Trinity Long Room Hub for hosting us this evening. Um, I am one of the coordinators of the Dublin History Research Network. You can now find us on Twitter at dub underscore his network. And thank you most importantly to our panelists this evening for a really engaging discussion. And there's been so much there to think about. I really appreciate that you gave up your time when you came along. Thanks as well to the audience who joined us and to everyone who gave a really fantastic question and took part. Thanks everyone. Cheers Lisa. Thank you Lisa and Kieran. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.